Um, true story, Bill Gates is um, down in Australia and he goes into a store to make a purchase for his wife. And uh, the clerk can't get the machine working and it's frozen, okay? And he kind of looks over in its little sheepish way and he says, you know, can I help? And she says, well, do you know anything about computers? He said, I, I think I can work it out. He steps out later, fixes the computer later in the day. Uh, the husband of the wife who owned that store looked at the receipt on the credit card and it was Bill Gates, never letting people know who he was. Uh, wonderful, wonderful story sometimes. Isn't it like me? Uh, I got two people. Uh, my wife has a little shop, Market Deli. And uh, I have a, a doctor of ministry in theology. And nobody knows it. And I have two guys that come into the store who are my instructors in Christianity. Okay, one guy's told me he spent between two and three million dollars on drugs and alcohol. Okay, he's on all kinds of medication. He tries to teach me the Bible. And then I have another guy that comes in the shop who uh, uh, feels like he is the Ghostbusters in the local cemetery, okay? And uh, he was actually a Navy SEAL. Uh, he lost two and a half years of his life. He said, I, all I knew I was partying in California, and I woke up in Portland, and I lost two and a half years. He teaches me about the fundamentals of faith. So these two gentlemen, so many times, so many times I came this close and saying, do you know that I have an advanced degree in theology and I was extra, I have not ever said a word, but thank God it was God. Because here are people coming who are trying to share their hearts and tell me something about their faith. And sometimes I say, they don't know what they're talking about. And yet when Jesus did his ministry, he walked among people like us with the disciples. Can you just imagine? You never see Christ going along and say, oh yeah, Oh yeah, Mount Hermon, I, I made that. Uh, <laughs> you never see him whether, you know, whether, when he's on the Sea of Galilee. Yeah, I, 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 I did that before I had my coffee one morning. He stays with us patiently. He doesn't treat us according to what we deserve. He never tries to prove who he is. He just walks in our midst with great, great humility. It's counterintuitive. It's the beginning of all other graces. And we're gonna drill down a little bit. I'd like to just share a couple stories up front. Uh, but I do want us to take a moment and think about what humility is. I want to ask you a question. How important do you think this issue is of humility for a Christian business leader? If you graduate, you get one of these, okay? This one is Al Shervon, okay? So he's, he's graduated. He gets a little of these. So this you put on your desk, and people kind of walk by. And, you know, ask the question, uh, how important is it to be consistent with what you say and do? W what do you think? In terms of importance, it, it's up there. You know, um, Francis uh, Saint Francis said, "Preach the gospel at all times. Use words if necessary." Right? Saint Basile said, "Annunciations are many, incarnations just a few." Um, so, if you have this thing on your desk, or people know you're a believer, and uh, you got a lot of stuff you're trying to control. You've got a lot of things you're trying to prove. A lot of pain in your life you're trying to protect. And they see this thing here. Do you think they might go by and just kind of, <sighs> you think they smell it? I know they smell it on me. And you know what? I can smell it in other people. You know why? Because I've got it. I got good friends in AA. You know what they say? An addict knows an addict. And if you have ever struggled with pride, and if you've ever been around people that drive you crazy because they struggle with pride, it's probably just beginning to reveal a little bit about you or a little bit about me. So how important is consistency? So some of us would say, I don't want to say anything, but is it pretty important? Who's that guy? <laughs> the king, who is this guy? The chosen one, LeBron James. Can anybody see that, what that tattoo says? What's it say there? Andy, you see it? Loyalty. What's it say? Loyalty. loyalty. Okay. And you remember it was on the, oh, loyalty. <laughs> now, how, how are you feeling about that picture? Give me a little visceral response. How are you feeling about that picture? <laughs> Forgiveness? Any, any anger? Any sense where the guy that has the loyalty tattoo on his body and then wears another uniform, 
Does it create some, uh, you know, discontinuity between what somebody says and what they actually do, or is it just me? Okay, it hits you in the gut. So there are people around us who hear our confession, know we go to church, work alongside of us, but sometimes stuff that we're involved with or the attitude or the posture that we bring, it hits them in the gut. It hits them deep in the gut. Uh, let me back up here. I'm going to leave that there for a minute. Uh, I'm not going to pass you out too much content stuff right now because I really want to engage us in the beginning. I want to tell you three stories about myself and all of them reek with pride. Uh, I want to start with the summer and then I want to share about something about teaching at uh, a theological seminary and I want to te uh, tell you one other third story and I'll decide which one I want to tell you then. Um, this, past, this past year has been the second most difficult year of my life. Um, the most difficult year of my life was actually 25 years ago when we almost lost my first son. My first son is 26 years of age and he had a, a ventral septal defect, hole in his heart and uh, aorta that had been uh, actually taken out of place. We ended up going, uh, had to go on public assistance. We went uh, $400,000 beyond our medical uh, coverage and uh, we were, had to really declare bankruptcy because we had no money and I was pastoring a church at that time. Horrible amount of stress on our marriage and family. This past year has been the second most. Um, and I have not suffered well. Uh, I have been angry. I have been short with my wife. Um, I've not been fun to live with. And the Lord kept tugging on my heart to say, um, repent to your wife uh, and tell her uh, that you love her, but tell her you haven't been fun to live with. Uh, you've not suffered well because you're not trusting God, Jean, and tell her that you really need her forgiveness. And so we sat on a park bench and we shared a sandwich and looked out on this pretty little bay out in New England, and I said that to her. And then as we talked, she said, you know what you really need to do is, is tell the kids. And it was hard enough to tell my wife. But our grown kids, I've got twin daughters, 29, boy 26 and another boy 20 and in the back of my mind I'm sitting around saying okay here's how this whole thing's gonna go okay and I should wash my wife's feet and then I should ask each of the kids to wash their feet and ask them for their forgiveness and the Lord said that's not what I told you to do I told you to go in there and obey me and do exactly what I told you to do so I I did that called them together and told you what I just told you. Said, you know, I haven't, I haven't been a man who's been kind to your mom. My stress has affected my spirit, and I've not been fun around, to be around, and I've not been the example that I really want to be for you in my faith and my trust in God, and I've allowed the stress to talk louder than I have my faith. Will you forgive me? And as a dad, you're thinking, oh well, you know, we, we did all right 29 years, but now it's, now it's kind of over. Each one of my kids, to a person, wrote me a card, has been sending me scriptures. My son, my one son and his fiance were on a fast for two weeks to see God work in my life. It's so counterintuitive, but it's exactly what God sometimes calls us to do. Um, for me, it was just obey the next thing I tell you to do. And it's that still small voice. Um, I had a class I taught about three years ago. Uh, it was summer intensive. There's about uh, maybe 12, 14 uh, students in the class. And we were doing some assessments. And uh, we were going around the table. And you know, when God just kind of puts something on your heart, you know that you know that you know what, what the answer is, what you're supposed to say. And I, I managed to do that with three or four different people in the class. And they were like amazed. And I knew it was the Lord. But I was starting to get afraid. So I came to this uh, young woman named Barbara. And I was afraid to tell her what the Lord had spoken to me to say to her. And so I said something else. It wasn't bad. It wasn't wrong. But it was not what God had asked me to say. So that night I'm cooking on the barbecue grill. And the Lord said, I want you to go back. And I want you to repent to the classroom that you did not ob obey my voice when I spoke to you. Okay. So, you know, I'm saying, okay, I've got to go back. I've got a doctorate degree. These are undergrads. I've got to go back to them and apologize that I didn't respond to what the voice of the Lord was for me in that moment. And that's what the Lord said, that's what you are to do. 
So I began the class with prayer, and then I said, uh, you know, I really want to, um, I'm going to need to apologize to Barbara, uh, and I'm going to need to apologize to use the class before this time is up. And so, of course, students are probably wondering what happened. So it was a time of prayer. I said at the end of the, the class, I'd, I'd like to be able to, uh, you know, be able to pray for each of the students. And so before we went around, and then I was going to give my apology at the end of the class, we prayed. And I got to this student whose name was Barbara, and, and I was standing behind her. There was another sister uh, on her left, and I was on her right. And I'm praying and saying, Lord, what do you want me to say? And he said to me in that moment, impressed upon me, revealed to me, I'm not trying to fight about words, how this, because I don't even understand it. Uh, the Spirit of the Lord impressed upon me to say, kiss her hair. And I'm saying, okay, Lord, I know protocol. I'm a professor. I'm a man. This is a student. I'm going to get fired and I'm going to have a lawsuit. And I just waited. I just waited. I said, Lord, what, what is it you'd have me to do? And then the little still voice comes, tell her the father wants to kiss her hair. So I said, Barbara, I believe the Lord is impressing upon me to say to you, the father wants to kiss your hair. She be broke down in tears and wept uncontrollably for three or four minutes before she could even get her breath back. I prayed for her. Then I was going to go to somebody else. She said, wait, wait. She opened up her Bible and took out a plastic bag that had locks of her hair in it. Because she had gone to a conference three months earlier, and it was on the woman who dried Jesus' feet with her tears and her hair. And the father had said to her in that moment, cut off a piece of your hair, put it in your Bible as an offering to me. Where did that happen? That happened in a moment when I was willing to humble myself at a barbecue grill that had nothing to do what I thought with somebody's healing. Let me share a third story and I'll figure out which story I want to share. Yes. That's a good question. Um, I, I've been growing in this. I've been growing in this. Uh, and I, I just remembered what I see if there's a scriptural example. Is there something in the model of Jesus' ministry? And is there a testimony or two or three witnesses? That's normally what I do. So is there a scriptural example? Do you see it in the ministry of Jesus? And then third, testimony of two or three witnesses. Now, give me your name. Is it Doug. Doug? So here's what I would do in that situation. I would go back to the Lord the first time I have anything that's kind of sensing, and I've been very impacted by, uh, by uh, Henry Blackaby in this whole area about hearing God or listening to God or responding to God. A lot of his material has been helpful. But I'll go back and say, Lord, is this just me or is this you? Now, if it comes back another time, or I'll sometimes pray and say, Lord, would you in this moment or in the next few moments show me that this is from you, then I will just take a step of obedience in accordance with a scriptural example, the model of Christ and the testimony of two or three witnesses. Uh, two or three witnesses can be a scripture, it may be a song, it may be all of a sudden that triggers a story that you've heard of something that's similar, but it's that willingness to humble yourself in that situation and just do what God has called you to do, no more, and just trust him for that moment. Um, does that help at all? We, yeah. we can pick it up a little bit later. Here's a third story, and then I want, I want some feedback because um, all of those stories reveal my pride with my family. It reveals pride in my workplace, which was a professor. And the third is being in a place that I don't want to be in. Uh, I'm in a place right now that I don't necessarily want to be in, but I know I'm exactly where God wants me to be. Uh, I had done something called intentional interim pastorates where you go to churches that have been conflict and I did seven of those okay when I was in New England and we were at a church in downtown Boston uh, at one time DL Moody said it was the greatest pulpit in America it, it sat 2500 people and we were had 88 people 19 million dollars in the bank 19 million dollars in the bank but no heart for the lost no heart for the city and uh, it was 
you know, it was 50-50 whether I was going to make it the first year as a turnaround pastor. And uh, I'm going to be very transparent. I, I, got, I was in prayers calling out to the Lord, just saying, Lord, why do you have me here? What are you doing in my life? Why aren't you working faster? Don't you love me? And I said this, I said, Lord, I'm sick and tired of you treating me like crap. But I'm not thinking crap. Okay? And I grew up as a fundamentalist. Okay? You don't talk to God like that. It's over, buddy. <laughs> you know, skeeter eater. Psh. So I'm saying, I just swore. I didn't say it out loud, but I thought it. I just swore at the God of the universe. It's over. And the voice of the Lord came to me and said, didn't you say I could place you wherever I wanted to place you? I said, oh, yes, Lord. Didn't you say I could use you however I want to use you? I said, yes, Lord. And then the third question, without any blame or incrimination at all, would it be all right with you if I placed you as an elder at the dung gate? <laughs> okay. And I just preached through Nehemiah. I said, Lord, I will be wherever you want me to be. So where are you right now? Maybe you're in a situation, maybe it's a marriage you thought was going to go one way and it's not. Uh, maybe your ideas of parenting, maybe the ideas of the workplace or career that you're supposed to be at a different place right now where you think you're supposed to be. But all of a sudden you find yourself in a place, you're saying, how in the world did I get here? Let me ask you, is that circumstance humbling you? Is that circumstance is dealing with some of the motives of your heart? You know, like what's your motive? What's your motive behind the motive? And what's your emotion behind the motive? They would just stop and just take about two minutes to do that, okay? So if you find yourself in a situation where you're being humbling, I want to ask you that question. What's your motive? What's your motive behind the motive? And what's your emotion behind the motive? And for me, all of these circumstances were beginning to reveal pride of where I thought I was supposed to be at a particular time in my life. So take, let's take, uh, take about five minutes. Have you suffered well? And the parentheses around that are those closest to you how have they observed your suffering? What would they say? So the first question would be is, how, has you, how have you suffered? And how have people closest to you observe your suffering? If they were to look inside of your soul. Uh, the second is the story that I shared about the teaching environment, which may not be your environment, but you have. When was the last time you displayed humility in your calling in your workplace? Can you recall what that is? So that was the second story I shared. And then the third, and I'll repeat these. Have you been ruthlessly honest? Have you been ruthlessly honest with God? And if there's the potential for what Isaiah and Jeremiah point to, that God knows our thoughts from afar, so he, he gets a whiff of who we are before we start our spiritual posing. And uh, Jeremiah is clear that one of the reasons why people get deceived in life is because there's pride in their heart. I have the potential, even though I have the truth of God's word, I have the potential to be deceived and deceive myself about myself. Okay? So you want me to re repeat those three questions? Um, am I ruthlessly honest with God? And I, we all say we're honest with God, but are we ruthlessly honest with God? And most of the time we're not until we're forced in situations where we need to be. Um, let me give you a couple ideas about humility, and then I'm, I'm going to take about... Can you repeat all of them? Sure will. Sure will. Uh, have you suffered well? Or how have you suffered? Any kind of circumstances? Al, don't look at me. <laughs> Al and I have been accountability partners the last 18 months. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and those around you who are closest to you, if they could look into your soul, what would they see? And that's why I shared the story about my family. My family did not see me suffering well. And for me, I was holding on. You know, the good, good thing is I've got a strong personality. The bad news is I have a strong personality. The second question is, 
When was the last time you displayed any humility in the workplace? That's where I, why I shared the teaching experience. It doesn't have to be as extreme as what I put. I did it to get your attention. For me, it had to be extreme probably because I'm more stubborn than you are. But when was the last time with an employee or customer or supplier or banker or whoever it might be, when was the last time you displayed any kind of humility in an event where you humbled yourself before somebody? And then the third is, have you been ruthlessly honest with God? And we're going to talk, we're going to drill down at the end. I've got some diagnostic questions as well as some practical things that we can do to display humility every single day. Um, let me just say three things. Humility, it's a challenge. I don't want to talk about it because I'll have to live it. So the fact that we even have a class that we're talking about it begins to put a framework around the fact that this is important. Every time we have that beautiful picture in this thing, if we get graduation, if you get one of these things and you hang it out there, it's a constant reminder of Christ's uh, example of what he's done for us. Uh, the second thing, it requires pain. Uh, it's a concept we can discuss, but to actualize it, it requires death to self. And, you know, God is not out to make you better. He's out to make you deader. He's not out to improve you. He wants to remove you. He does not want to refine you. He wants to redefine you. And when you find yourself in situations, do not think it's strange that God wants to rearrange you. And as you understand that, God is in this process of using all of these things, your workplace, your marriage, your community, your inadequacies, the little things on the timeline that we just looked at after his purpose. C.K. Chesterton said this, many people say that Christianity has been tried and found false, but I say Christianity has been found true, but difficult and therefore left undone. And it's a wonderful quote that reminds us that we often get close to some of these concepts, but because they're painful, we back away from them, because they're threatening, because we're afraid. Uh, my wife had a wonderful slide of two women uh, at a very wealthy neighborhood having tea and this very fine kind of uh, beautiful, beautiful, opulent home. And the one was holding up the, the teacup, talking to the other and said, um, I can't say I really died to self, but I did feel faint once. <laughs> And isn't it true, you know, we're getting there and God's using all these things and we're just about ready for the breakthrough and then we just kind of back away and we find ourselves going around the same mountain again. You find yourself going around the same mountain again. Is there some place in your home, your workplace, your marriage, your emotions that you say, you know, I've been here before, but I can't really, I can't really understand why I'm here before, why I've been here before. Can I just suggest to you, because I've, you know, I've run treads around that mountain, okay? I've bored holes around the mountain, but I've never gone through the mountain. For me, it was because there was pride in my heart that I could not see that did not allow me to fully trust God that he was working off all the things I talked about. I came this close to experiencing but I always would back off. So is there any place, if I were to have a discussion question now, is there any place in your life where you find yourself going around the mountain again, but you never ask yourself the question, am I at this part of the mountain again? Because it may have something to do with the issue of humility. And then the third thing I'd like to say up front is this issue of uh, humility. It's, it's counterintuitive. It's counterintuitive. Um, when I had the privilege of doing this, I said, we as Americans don't understand this, okay, uh, except in one area, and that's losing weight, okay? So if you go on a diet and you lose weight, losing is what? Losing is winning? Losing is gaining? But uh, so when we come to this issue of death to self, from Jesus' perspective, from a Christian worldview, if you're dying to self and you are losing from a Christian standpoint, you're actually doing what? You're gaining. You're winning. You're growing. You're deconstructing, so Christ is reconstructing you. It is what uh, Steve talked about, change from the inside out. Is this, is this making sense? Okay, so if, if uh, we're going to uh, take a little bit of time of understanding from a Christian worldview that pride is the greatest sin, the fall of Satan and the fall of original mankind, 
And that humility, humility truly is the foundation of all other graces. Okay, I just want to repeat those things. I'll, we'll drill down a little bit about that. But uh, from Catholic theologians, from Christian theologians, from contemporary writers, from the big picture of a Christian worldview, it was pride that was the source of Satan's fall. And it's pride that was the source of mankind's fall. And all the other writers will say this, that humility, humility is the foundational grace which all other graces of character grow out of. You can't be compassionate unless you're humble. You can't be forgiving unless you're humble. You can't show mercy unless you're humble. You can't be patient unless you're humble. Go on. Just take a moment and think about what virtue or what character quality that we might have being shaped and formed into the image of Christ without humility. And so when you begin to start unpack this thing, you're getting to see that pride is the thing that like a diet, I'm spiritually fat because I'm carrying all this pride and it's getting in my way. I keep going around the mountain again. And all of a sudden, God begins to speak to me and saying, you know, the reason why you can't change your attitude, the reason why you react so quickly is because you're proud. I'm going to talk about reactions when we close today. I had uh, a couple experiences, but I'll tell you one. It was January, and it was a beautiful in New England. We have sun. We, we, my wife and I have a little coffee shop, market. She's standing in the front. Um, she gets there about, oh, 3.30 in the morning and starts prayer, and the coffee is on by 5. And I usually wander down around 6.30, 7 o'clock for my first cup of coffee. She's standing in the front there, so happy. The sun is coming in, you know, eastern sky. We're far east in Massachusetts, uh, in Gloucester. And she's standing there in front of the heater, and the sun's coming in. She said, I said, what are you doing? She says, oh, I'm, I'm just getting my vitamin D, okay? <laughs> okay, now here's what I do. This is latitude 43. It's a winter month. You need exposure of at least 15 minutes to the front of your body and the back of your body to get the minimum amount of 400 IUs per a vitamin. Uh, what is it, D, you need? And you know what I said? I said, honey, that's great. You just enjoy that. It's not the first thought. You've got to have the second thought. It's not the first emotion. It's the second emotion. But you know what that was? That was pride. I knew more about her moment than she did. And what I was doing in my left brain was automatic. You know what the good news was? I didn't say what I thought, and I didn't say what I felt, because humility allowed me to listen beyond what she said to what she needed. And when you train leaders, you go for IQ, EQ, CQ, and SQ, OK? Intelligence, emotional intelligence, cultural intelligence, and spiritual intelligence. Remember Doug Holliday was here and he said why, he had that book about why right brain people will rule the world. You remember that title when he was here? He was talking about this whole understanding of leadership that is based on intangibles versus tangibles. So let's drill down just a little bit. Um, can you imagine what's the difference between humility and humiliation by any chance? Any guesses? Okay, oh, I talked to you, you got it right away, but talk to me a little bit about it. Uh, it's more, uh, it's more, uh, it's, it's not a willful okay. choice of, uh, of submission. It's kind of bestowed upon you. So you've got some nice tan pants on. If I spill water on the front of your pants <laughs> and ask you to walk across the room, that would be, that would be, yeah, that'd be a good trick, but that'd be humiliation. Yeah, right? yeah. Now, if by chance, uh, you, you were able to receive some water that somebody else spilt who were kind of stumbling and you were willing to take that and pick that up, then you would be actually showing humility because you would have been serving that person. Or you could use the Billy Madison example. Right? Go ahead. The kid, the kid pees on himself and then Billy Madison throws some water on his head. Or if it's a happy girl yeah, that's, that's right. That's right. Okay. That's exactly. Now, part of, the prob part of the problem is we sometimes react to humility as if it's humiliation. Okay. We feel like that. <laughs> How'd you like to be that? This is a father training his son as a sumo wrestler. <laughs> and, and it says sometimes the best way to show your kids the ropes is to throw them out of the ring. <laughs> oh, man. What a, what a sight. What a sight. You just can't, can't get enough of that, can you? <laughs> um, I believe that often we as believers feel 
Like this is God and this is us. You know what I'm saying? That's not what's happening. If we don't get through the humiliation to learn humility, we will see it as rejection. We'll interpret it as, as God no longer finding something that he wants to work in us. And we're thinking we're getting thrown out of the ring. I, 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 it's the difference between being put in the penalty box or being thrown out of the game. When you play hockey, guess what? There's a few fights in hockey, just in case you didn't know. But there's a difference by being put in the penalty box so you can learn something to get back in the game. And many of us, I think, get confused with things that happen to us in our life that we feel like we're out of the game when in fact God has just put us in the penalty box for a little while to learn some lessons. Um, I want to talk a little bit about leadership and now I'm going to put my hand out. <laughs> so if you guys could pass those out and uh, you could pass those out. I didn't give you the handout up front because you had a lot of content today. Mark, you have a question? I was just thinking, uh, Speak up loud so everybody can yeah, hear you. Yes, for instance, the Babylonian captivity. Thanks. Yeah. They, re they rejected the prophets. They stayed proud. You know, God pleaded with them over and over and over and over, and then they, and they disobeyed in addition. And then finally God said, okay, I'm going to bring another nation to drag you off and humiliate you. I mean, they used to taunt them. Play us songs from Jerusalem, you slaves. You know, entertain us. You know, that kind of thing. Actually, the Babylon captivity. The other is, of course, Pharaoh. Right, an illustration Pharaoh was. Um, he didn't want to humble himself until, in fact, you know, God had an holy ultimate uh, weapon of life and death at the end. Uh, what I'd like you to do is, if you will, there's a lot of material here, if you've noticed. Um, and what I want, to, uh, I want you to look at is on page 8. Why we as leaders have challenges with humility, or I have it entitled Humility and the Correlation of Leadership uh, and the Pitfalls of Pride. And I'm going to give you three major reasons. I'm not going to unpack them all. Leaders are different, leaders are vulnerable, and leaders have blind spots. Um, the first thing, leaders think differently. They're creative and quote-unquote outside the box. Uh, I have a resource uh, the best tape I've ever heard on this uh, by, is by John Maxwell, and he has 10 ways that leaders think differently. And uh, I have a resource for that if you, if, if you need uh, uh, where to find that. It makes a great case that leaders just perform differently because they perceive differently. Okay, so if, if you're different, one of the things of being different, you can feel a little bit better than somebody else. Uh, there's a book out called The Cinderella Effect, and it was actually written by a supporter of our present president, um, and uh, he was critiquing President Obama on the Cinderella Effect. And he asked this question. He said, I voted for Obama. Uh, and he writes this book to critique our president for this reason. He said, how is it when somebody gets into a position of leadership, they become an expert on everything? Nutrition, athletics, <laughs> family, <laughs> you know, on and on. He lists the whole thing. Because you're different and you're put in a position of quote unquote leadership, there is this tendency that you feel like you're an expert on everything. The second thing, uh, leaders are change agents, so therefore they find themselves uh, wanting to see a new future, and that's a good part of being a leader. It's, um, it's what John Stott says, vision begins with a holy discontentment with the status quo. And the thing that I think we wrestle with, at least you should wrestle with as a leader, is your discontentment holy or not? And so that great capacity to see vision and see down the road is a great gift. On the other hand, if you don't ask the question, is your frustration holy or human, like me, I found myself way down the road with doing things. Doing things, we're going to take a, a, a we are finish at four? Yeah. Okay, all right. Then I'm going to have to speed up. Let me just uh, give you that. The leaders are vulnerable. 
they have a preoccupation with action. They can become hyper-focused, which creates a, a blind spot. They can move too quickly and become overconfident. Leaders have blind spots. Even they have preoccupation with action, they have a deficit with spiritual reflection. They can be derailed. They become so emotionally passionate about what they're trying to achieve, they become emotionally enmeshed and defensive. And they have power and authority because of their position in the organization. Because you have power and authority, so says C.S. Lewis, the most dangerous combination is pride and power mixed together. Okay? Um, C.S. Lewis has a great article called The Power of the Ring, and it was him and Tolkien trying to figure out how world civilization got so raw after World War I and World War II, and you now you know The Lord of the Rings? Well, The Lord of the Rings started with an address by C.S. Lewis in 1948 to the incoming class at Oxford. And he says, many of you would not be subject to some of the sins and temptations that, quote unquote, the lower class. But most of you are not aware of the danger of the power of the ring. You will be the leaders, and he's speaking to the next leaders of, of England. And he summarizes that by saying, the power of the ring is those who have power will kill to keep it. Those who don't have power will kill to get it. And uh, he critiqued the human spirit that if you're a leader and you have position, you are very vulnerable. Uh, let's do two more pieces quick, and as we're uh, moving on a couple of those pages down the road, um, the Hebrews had the Ten Commandments of no other gods. The Egyptians had a skeleton at their feast to remind them that you were, you were mortal, and the Romans actually hired a slave that would actually go in the chariot of a Roman conqueror when they're beating the drum, and he would say, you're only immortal. You're only immortal. You're only immortal. But we as Americans, it's just the opposite. Charles Stanley said our culture is based on appearance, performance, status, and success, which is an anti-grace state. Let's uh, move, if you will, to close to the end here. I want to, um, going deeper, it's page 11. Humility is more than an action, it's a posture, it's an attitude, it's how we react under pressure. Humility is all about focus, it's about your focus upon God and not your circumstances. And I'm just going to hit maybe three of these and then uh, we'll take a break and we'll do some diagnostic questions when we come back. Are we ruthlessly honest before God? Jeremiah 49, 16 said, pride, the pride of your heart leads to deception. The pride of your heart leads to deception. Uh, I was a home missionary of a church and we had built a new building and the pastor of the church that was going to be dedicating our sanctuary in that day was Dr. Gordon McDonald who was at that point the president of InterVarsity Fellowship. He sat in the front seat of the car with his wife. I was in the back seat of the car with my wife. And he said, Gene, they're never going to remember how smart you are. They're never going to remember your great sermons or what a great leader you are. But you know what they're going to remember? They're going to remember how you treated your wife and your kids. During that time, he had been in a three-month three extramarital affair. So what he was telling me was absolutely true. He, uh, five years later, James Dobson interviewed him and said, Gordon, you preach this book you knew it forward and backwards. Your first book was called Magnificent Marriage. I, I, I read it a couple times. He said, how is it that someone who had so much truth and was so close to the knowledge of God could stray so far? And I never forget uh, what he said to Dobson on that national program. He said, Jim, I had to come to the conclusion that I am a deceptive person. And it wasn't until he got to that core that he began to grow in humility. Oswald Chambers says this, an unguarded strength becomes a double weakness. An unguarded strength becomes a double weakness. Be ruthlessly honest before God. Second of all, I'm going to go down a few. Learn from failure and criticism. 
Who are the people that are driving you crazy with telling you what you're doing and doing it wrong? Well, practice the 5% factor. You can put practice the 5% factor. Is there 5% validity or truth what they're saying that you need to hear? You know what I do? I fight them for the 95%. It doesn't mean I have to do everything they say, but what happens is we get in a, we got in a jam rather than saying, Kevin, you know what? You just said seven things that I think are outrageously wrong. But one of those things was absolutely right. Kevin, you know what? I really do appreciate you've pointed out something that we have not done in our organization or something that I need to hear as a leader, and I thank you for that. So when you find yourself growing in humility, if somebody's 95% wrong, are you willing to acknowledge and learn from the 5%? Recognize that confrontation can be an excellent opportunity to grow in 5%. Go down two more. Receive accolades lightly, but reflect God's glory deeply. You are designed to be a glory bearer, not a glory receiver. And it's a nuance. It's just a nuance. In the 1980s, uh, there were about eight to 10 big ministers who fell nationally. And I went to a conference that day. A man had a PhD in psychology and also a, a master's of theology. We spent the whole day together to try to understand. And that one conclusion was the conclusion that the human heart was not created to receive glory. God was, and God alone was to receive glory. And there's these things where we are to bear glory but we are to return it. But when we beget something in ourself that we begin to receive glory, it makes our soul go south. I'm gonna do two more and then ask a question and then Al, you wanna open it up to questions at that point? Accept mystery with childlike simplicity. Accept mystery with childlike simplicity. You all read uh, The Call by Os Guinness? Okay. All right, you read a couple chapters, but you said you read it. It's okay. <laughs> this is on humility. It's not on honesty. <laughs> Two things I got out of the book that just were killer for me. Um, the stewardship of mystery. That when you are a Christian and when you're a Christian business leader, you are called for the stewardship of mystery. And he quotes Paul that I'm a mystery of the gospel in which I'm in chains. There are, th I, I'm having a hard time sometimes being a steward of tangible things. I know Richard, that's what you do with your life. But how about being a steward of mystery? And I have kept that from reading that book and, and I use it all the time for myself personally. The second thing is, if you consider yourself a servant of Christ, you have to renounce the selfishness of clarity. Can I repeat that? If you are a servant of Christ, and this is out of Guinness's work, you have to be willing to renounce the selfishness of clarity. And now I'm gonna get vulnerable for a moment. The reason I don't suffer well is because I don't accept not having an answer when I think God should be giving me an answer. And so what happens is I'm frustrated and in my frustration, rather than open palms, I'm clenched fists. And that story I shared with you up front is the people around me really love me and know I have a good heart. But my circumstances, rather than saying, I need to know why, I need to know how, I need to know where, I need to know when, I need to know the big why question. I need to renounce, I'm a servant of Christ, like I shared that story, the elder at the Dungate, I will go where you want me to go. I will do what you want me to do. And I will respond to your voice regardless of what you say.